Newman. I study coronaviruses for a living. I'm going to do this one as a um, uh, kind of a screenshot so that you can see some of the data as I'm going through it. So the question is from Saida. How you doing Saida? Uh, always good to hear from you. Um, and uh, it's about a particular article, this one that's in front of me, and uh, saying what do you think? Is this, uh, is this good? It looks like it, it looks like science. Yeah, essentially. Um, so let's go through it. And um, yeah, my reading of this is that it's uh, very much not good, but it is done in a way that makes it look good to people who probably, yeah, don't go into the details and haven't got a lot of experience with what a, like a virology paper would look like. All right, so first of all, uh, we're doing great here. We got a nice uh, title there, lovely. Uh, sophisticated laboratory modification. Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, right, uh, rather than natural evolution. And so right there with that title, you would want to see, uh, if you're gonna put a paper together like this, you want expertise in those two areas. So you want some people with some molecular biology experience who are good at moving genes around, uh, maybe a little bit of synthetic biology uh, in the lab. And uh, you would also want somebody with some experience on natural evolution. Now, not just for like dogs or cats or ponies, but natural evolution in viruses, which is like a faster, you know, more uh, hardcore version of uh, <laughs> try everything and keep what works. Yeah. <laughs> and so you say, okay, because um, that's, those are the people that would have enough expertise to actually be able to make a claim like this and lay out the data and do the tests in a way that would make it stick. Now, who did this study? Well, we've got all these people here, and that's great. Some are PhDs, some are MD PhDs. I don't know what their PhDs are in, but they all work for a thing called the Rule of Law Society and Rule of Law Foundation in New York, New York, USA. And so, okay, yeah, fine. And so I want to see what the heck's the rule of law society slash whatever. Pardon all my tabs. And so we put this into the Google thing. And there we go. Second one, um, rule of law society. And look who it is. Look who it is. That's Steve Bannon, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Fractal Steve Bannon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> multiple levels. Like, wow, looking good. Looking good in person and on the big screen. So this, uh, if you go up here to their uh, vision and mission to expose corruption, obstruction, illegality, brutality, false imprisonment, excessive sentencing, harassment, and inhumanity, oh my gosh, in the blah, blah, blah systems of China. So this is a group that is dedicated to pointing out, um, yeah, either legitimate or not legitimate problems of China, but it's basically a um, political uh, concern, not a scientific concern necessarily. And these are all people that at least according to the paper that they have just published are members of this society. And uh, if they have academic appointments anywhere, it does not show in the paper. And um, that would be a red flag on its own if there weren't... Uh, it's, it's basically a a nice big hot air balloon like the ones that Richard Branson used to fly, all stitched together out of little silky red flags. <laughs> so uh, let us let us go further into this uh, nightmare pit of just uh, absolutely insane stuff. Okay, so one of their conclusions is that certain sequences, which are part of the public database, can be believed, and other sequences, which would... Um, uh, I don't know if they would disprove their half-baked theories, but they at least pose some real problems for it. And it's a whole bunch of sequences from a lot of different groups, but they've decided that all of these are uh, not validated. They've, they've all been tampered with. And they don't show any evidence for why they think they've been tampered with other than that these other sequences don't meet with their idea. And so their big idea is, wait for it, let's scroll down. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so first of all, they're saying that, ah, this new virus is similar to old viruses, which, you know, if you were on the committee that named the virus, or maybe even if you're not, maybe if you're part of the uh, thinking public, we could call them, <laughs> you can say that, yeah, this is uh, part of the species, SARS, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus, which means it's got to be pretty darn close to the original Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus, 
or uh, the original SARS-CoV, yeah, the one from way back in the early 2000s. So the first uh, figure they show is a similarity plot, and they're comparing each of these things to uh, some other virus. I'm not sure if they're comparing them all to original SARS or not. Um, I'm not sure that it says. It just says it's a similarity plot. Oh, there we go. Based on uh, WIV04. Uh, okay. So fine. So that's one of the human strains. And so they've got a variety of bat strains, uh, but they're comparing WIV4 to itself, and it's not coming out as 100% identical. So I think, I think they did something else. I think these are all compared to maybe SARS coronavirus number one. But what you can see here is that the most similar one, which is ZC45, now they've left out um, a strain called RATG, which is one, RATG13 right up there, which is from um, uh, Rhinolophus affinis bat. And this is the one that's actually closest. It's uh, much more similar. It's um, something like uh, about a thousand nucleotides different out of 30,000. So uh, 3%, 4%, something like that, if I've got my uh, math right. Um, but this thing is at best about 90% similar. And some of these others are as low as, like take the average through here, something like 80% uh, similar at a nucleotide level. So these are viruses that are part of a group. They probably have all the same equipment, but they've been evolving independently for a long time. Uh, this is a virus that in the human population will make and keep about one mutation, uh, or rather about 30 mutations a year. And so to get a thousand mutations at the rate of 30 mutations a year, I'll let you do the math, but it's a long time you would have to wait unless you're putting in some kind of weird chemical to try and accelerate the process. And even then, I think you'd be more likely to get a dead virus than um, get anything that is mutated as consistently as this. Uh, you, you get this sort of uh, difference from evolution all the time, like everywhere in everything. And uh, so I, I don't see there, it, there's anything in here that says that it has to be um, manipulated. Um, then they pick out the smallest functional gene from this thing and decide that this is also uh, good evidence. Uh, so they've got uh, some... Uh, BM48 is quite a, a different uh, bat virus. And you've got some other uh, beta coronaviruses that were pulled out of uh, various bats um, uh, at different times. And I am just not sure what all these parts. Oh no, maybe these are all, yeah, okay, these are all the same gene, or at least part of the same gene, um, for the uh, E protein. And so we've got different groups of viruses. That's it. So we've got uh, original SARS, uh, new SARS, and animal SARS, I think, or a variety of uh, bat SARSes, and then uh, moving over here. And so this is showing that, uh, at least in this little tiny sample, um, there isn't a whole lot of variation. It doesn't really show anything more than that. It just shows that, uh, in general, the bat sequences are pretty close to the human sequences, which would suggest to perhaps a uh, yeah somebody who participates in the thinking sciences that, uh, you know, yeah, uh, bat viruses, which we've known about for years, may be a possible source of where this human coronavirus came from. Not that there's necessarily laboratory malfeasance involved. You'd have to show that. That's the problem. Um, I would say one other uh, thing to uh, point out about this article is that it's not actually published in the way that articles are normally published. So normally you go through a thing called peer review where other scientists have a look at what you've done and try and figure out whether there's um, anything sensible about it or not. This is put up on Zenodo which is a database site where you can submit any database that you want if there is no other... The idea is if there's no other way for you to get this published, but there's some legal requirement that you have to publish it, you can dump it on Zenodo, no questions asked, and it'll just sit there. And so rather than a published paper, this is one of these droppings, basically, <laughs> that uh, yeah, these goofballs have put up here for uh, apparently political reasons. Now this is the this is the really fun one. So we've got Wuhan HU1. This is uh, one of the first strains of the um, new coronavirus in people. If I'm uh, if I got that correctly, 
all the way down to original SARS coronavirus is I think what they're uh, indicating with that. We have to look through the um, uh, actual um, sequence numbers. And you can see that you've got this group that's close to SARS. So this is an animal virus that's close to SARS, and this is SARS. And yeah, they're pretty similar to each other, and they're really different to these other ones. You can tell they're similar because look at the coloring. Look at all the nice little black letters that are on here that you don't have up here, and look at all the blue letters up here that you don't have down there. So the colors will kind of guide you. And so you've really got two different groups of viruses here, and so you probably shouldn't consider these things in the same you know, uh, sentence as uh, these guys, because uh, they're, they're kind of different things. Up here at the top, we've got uh, legit SARS coronavirus 2 and some of the more closely related uh, animal viruses. Um, the top two are from China and from the USA after coming from China, presumably. And so you can see that those two are quite similar. There are some differences with the bat viruses, but look everywhere that there's black, because black is signifying things that don't match. Red is signifying things that match completely, and blue is, signif is the kind of in-between. That's our Goldilocks thing. So none of these is a particularly good match for anything else, and there are a lot of changes all over the place. The changes that they think are evidence of tampering are that this region right here is changed, and it actually looks a lot like one of those viruses that was found associated with civets. And we think that the civets may be catching bat viruses somewhere on the way to market. Um, that's the best hypothesis right now. Um, but they left those out because they've decided that those are uh, untrustworthy for reasons that don't make any sense and would get hammered hard if they went <laughs> to uh, um, an actual peer review and had anybody at all competent. Um, the other thing they point out is, uh, once again, this is a thing called the polybasic cleavage site. This is a thing that allows the SARS coronavirus 2 to be a little bit more efficient at getting into cells than uh, some of the other versions. I believe you find the same polybasic cleavage site in some of those animal viruses that they are excluding, but because they've decided not to include those, and they're only comparing it to a virus that doesn't have that particular sequence, it looks as though this sequence only appears in the human SARS coronavirus 2. And what you miss when you do dumb analysis like this, not, not that you're dumb, but that they are, yeah, they, they want, they're trying to see something or trying to convince you of something, but it's not being done in the way that science is supposed to do it. It's not being done carefully and in a controlled way. Yeah. Um, and so, and there are also all these other, uh, they're saying don't pay attention to any of these other uh, blue or black bits. They don't matter, uh, like all these up here, they don't really matter. It's only this one. That's uh, part of the tampering, engineering, uh, which is th those uh, particular sequences occur in something like half of all known coronaviruses. So they're pretty common. They don't happen to be in SARS coronavirus 1. They do happen to be in SARS coronavirus 2. They're in some animal coronaviruses, not in others. It's just a thing that's fairly easy to evolve and fairly easy to delete. And uh, yeah, <laughs> good luck telling which. Okay, so we've got two nonsense figures so far. This is the one, though, where we go completely. We take a big dive into the waters of insanity. Um, uh, so they're looking over here and they're saying, ah, look, there are restriction enzyme cleavage sites. Now, there used to be these nice programs, uh, things like Gene Runner, that would let anybody just play around with a sequence. And what they would do is spit out a list of hundreds and hundreds of restriction enzyme cleavage sites because these are little patterns in RNA or DNA. Uh, in this case, it's RNA, but they're treating it as if it's DNA. Um, and uh, they can be cut by a particular kind of enzyme from bacteria. And that's fine. You can look up all the details on that if you really want to. Um, of these things, so, so they exist all over the place. And just because they're combinations of four or six or sometimes seven or sometimes even eight nucleotides, and there's only so many ways you can combine that many nucleotides. And so when you get enough nucleotides, there will be one of these things because we know about hundreds of restriction enzymes. Um, and then they're pointing over here saying that these are uh, mutated and restriction enzymes don't work if they're mutated, so they're saying that uh, ZC45 was maybe the template and that they went in and changed this thing to have a chunk where they could take out everything in between these. It's just, it's the weirdest 
imagined yeah it's i don't know <laughs> fantasy fantasy role playing um you, you expect them to be running around the woods and shouting you know i cast fireball yeah <laughs> while they're uh, uh coming up with these theories um that's basically what this paper looks like uh to me this is uh larping without any particular skill uh related to science in there and yeah, I don't know, it's by a bunch of people who are politically connected and must have some ability to work with sequence data. Um, but once again, there are tools that basically do all the work for you. And so they're at least able to operate the tools. But I mean, you know, because you can operate a hammer, does that make you a carpenter? I would argue no, based on the things I've tried to build, <laughs> for sure. Um, uh, Fear and Cleavicite, and they have um, excluded all the viruses that have it and only kept all the viruses that don't have it in here to compare it. And so now it's like, oh my gosh, SARS coronavirus 2, definitely engineered. Yeah. And again, not that this is a really common feature on coronaviruses in all kinds of animals and people all throughout the world and always has been and is found in other viruses like influenza and just it's all over the place. It's a thing that evolves naturally with uh, great frequency. Um, yeah, so uh, that's what we call cherry picking, spotting things that could be restriction nucleotide, um, uh, restriction enzyme uh, cleavage sites is a thing that can be done. You can find some restriction endonucleotide cleavage site anywhere, anywhere that you want, or uh, restriction enzyme, sorry. Uh, endonuclease. That's the word I was fishing for and stumbling on. And so now they've made up this awesome, completely made up scheme where if you had two viruses, you could chop out a little part of one and put it in the other. Problem is, problem is, scroll back up here, not that one. So that, that would solve one problem. How did we get this little uh, part here that's very different together? Now the other question is, how do you change one out of every 10 nucleotides on the entire rest of the genome in such a way that that does not kill the virus because most random mutations in a virus like this will be lethal. And so you can make the changes, but you will usually get dead virus. So we're talking about somebody would have to put in billions of dollars and years of time to be able to do these crazy things that they're suggesting. And it's it's just all, it's all complete nonsense, but um, from a scientific point of view, this is kind of why it's nonsense, and it's not actually published in any kind of uh, way that a scientific paper normally would be published. And uh, so this is um, weird opinion piece slash fan fiction, and because it is being presented, because they've presented this fiction in a form that makes it look like a scientific paper, where you have to actually dig into the details and you know pry up the floorboards to see what the heck is going on underneath. I think a lot of people are going to look at this and say, yeah, I mean, it looks, it's got the title line, the author line, the uh, a corresponding uh, author um, uh, email address. Why, why wouldn't be, this be science? So it's, it's nonsense with the trappings of science, um, but there's nothing substantial here and nothing that I think would stand up to even a half-assed uh, peer review process, I would say. So <laughs> that's probably more explanation than you or anybody else ever would have wanted, but um, you got to do what you like with it. <laughs> Thanks very much. This has been Ask Dr. Ben.